Our New Testament lesson comes from Luke. Luke has a great concern for the fate of the poor. Although he himself would have been an educated man and probably of some means, he emphasizes God's special love and concern for the outcast and the overlooked in society. Our passage is called the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There are two curiosities, probably more than that with this parable, but first it's the only parable in which the characters are named, and Lazarus has the meaning, his name means he whom God helps. And the other thing about this story is it's the only parable in which we have that Jesus refers to the afterlife. Let's listen, you and I, for God's word as it comes to us. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends our reading. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, your word is before us now stories from long ago and yet fresh as the dawn this day. We'd ask that you would open our eyes, unplug our ears, expand our hearts, capture our imagination that we might dare to see and to believe the good news you'd have for us this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I started a story by saying a priest, a rabbi, and a Presbyterian minister show up at the pearly gates. You know that whatever comes next, or I trust you would assume that whatever comes next isn't going to be exactly true. That that's uh, at least not true with a capital T uh, in that word, in that use of that word. It's the beginning of a story. And it's a story that's meant to make a point, a story that maybe would make us laugh with a surprise ending. Now, according to custom, the way you're supposed to tell jokes like that, the person who's in the third slot is the one that they'd have something out of the ordinary happen to him or to her. Uh, you know, and that's, if it's a good story, it's one that maybe does make us laugh in our surprise, but also we learn something from what happens the way that story unfolds. Now, 
I've been told I'm a little hard on Presbyterian pastors, so I'm not going to to uh, do finish that story, but I'll tell you another story this morning, same concept in mind. Not actually true, true. Um, Bill Gates, imagine, uh, dies, and he finds himself at the pearly gates with St. Peter. Now St. Peter comes to welcome him to the front door, and he's impressed with uh, Bill's many contributions to society, you know, how efficient workplaces have come, how how much we have learned with the internet, with computers at the workplace. You know, Peter says, ah, oh, you know, Bill, good, good stuff here. You know, and then Peter, you know, flips the page. He's got a rather long entry here under, under Bill's name. And he said, oh, okay, don't, don't know. Some of this is starting to confuse me. I'm, I'm not quite sure here what to do with you, Bill. Um, I'm going to do something that I've never really done before. I'm going to let you decide where you want to go here. I'll let you visit both heaven and Hades, and then you can choose. You know, where do you want to spend eternity? You know, well, Bill says, okay, appreciate this chance. I'm going to, I'll go and see Hades first. I'll go down and there he finds, you know, sunny beaches, palm trees, people laughing, frolicking about in the water. It's perfect, 80 degrees temperature. Then Bill goes to visit heaven where, you know, there are angels drifting about, playing harps, people being reunited, their heavenly choruses singing, you know, but heaven was nice, but maybe not quite as enticing or as appealing as Hades was for him. And so Bill decides that, uh, you know, he'd rather spend eternity in Hades. Fine, says St. Peter, as you desire, and off he goes. Two weeks later, St. Peter decides he's going to go down, pay a call to uh, Bill, see how he's doing. He found Bill then shackled to a wall. Ta tormented by flames, the devil prodding him with a pitchfork, waving Apple computers in front of him, cries out. Uh, Bill cries out to St. Peter, this, this is awful. It's nothing like the Hades that I visited just two weeks ago. What happened to that other Hades, that one with the summer beaches and people playing in the sand? St. Peter just said, that was the demo version. That was our beta. Parables. Windows 9 is coming out for you IBM folks here. Yeah, <laughs> Parables are these wonderful things. They can tell us about life. They can speak truth. They're not preaching. Nor do they tell us what they are trying to tell us. We don't have the author here giving us the moral of the story at the ending just in case we missed it. Only once in scripture does Jesus resort to explaining the meaning of a parable, and that doesn't happen in this one. And that took place when the disciples were obviously so dumbfounded that they didn't know where to even begin to make sense of what Jesus had said. This story is simply given to us, and we are left to pick it up and consider it, see what it might mean for us. And all during his ministry, Jesus would do this. He would use parables in order to teach. And they're wonderful, and they're infuriating at the same time because we're never exactly sure what they are supposed to mean. They paint these pictures for us. They give us a snapshot, and we need to take that picture and to look at it and then to look at our own lives and then to try to figure out what's going on. What do we need to take from this story, this day, for our lives right now? We do need to find ourselves in this story to make sense of how it's pertinent to us. These aren't just words once upon a time locked up in time. They come and they are for us this day. And it's a difficult passage for us. Each one of us will hear this parable and it might ignite different things in our imagination. And I think that that's good. Now having said all that, I'm still going to dare to offer some interpretive comments. Now, it's thought with this story that the basis of it actually comes from a well-known Egyptian joke that's about a rich man and a poor man who are being surprised at where they find themselves after death, that this would have been you know, something of a common story that was being traded around at that time. And while Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, who were known as lovers of money, the rich man in our story 
isn't a Pharisee. He's a Sadducee. And they didn't believe in heaven or hell. They believed that everything in life was to be experienced here and now. So that if you were righteous, God would bless you. The more that you had accumulated, sort of the more stuff in your garage, that was the more righteous you were before God, and God was obviously blessing you. And so part of the surprise ending for the Sadducee was that there was life after death at all. Surprise number one. Whole theologies about heaven and hell have been developed from this particular story. And while I don't want to say that it isn't about life after life, as I look at it, I think Jesus was perhaps using this to get us thinking about our present life now, how we treat each other here and now, and how hard it is, how hard it can be for us to change. Again, my thoughts. I don't know, I don't think that the parable is so much a story about what happens to us after we die, or even a warning to those who are rich or, or those who are poor. It is, I think, an image for us to help see what it can be like to be so separated from another person or from one another that we feel like we are over a wall that cannot be breached, to, that cannot be overcome, that we are locked out from one another, from strangers. We're locked out from loved ones. We're locked out from God. It's a powerful description of how big a chasm can develop between people and what anguish there can be felt if you feel like there is no way for me to connect with that person. There is no way for me to reach them, to communicate, to send a heartfelt message. So Jesus uses this old joke, this familiar reversal story, in order to lead people to a new way of thinking. He adds the conversation between the rich man and Lazarus to give us a glimpse into the mindset of the rich man. And we see that cruelty doesn't have to look cruel. Cruelty can sometimes simply consist of a will not to see or the decision not to hear things that might disturb the complacency of material comfort. You know, there are many things that surround us that can block the world out. And Jesus tells us about this rich man, clothed in purple. He would have been an elite member of society. He's so rich that he doesn't just host dinners. He feasts sumptuously. It's Thanksgiving every day for him. While wearing these linen clothes that royalty would wear, if you're in purple, you're a big deal. He's got purple underwear on seven days a week. And so at the gate of this rich man's house, we're told there was a beggar, and Maybe beggar is a stretch, but in Jesus' day, beggars were seen as offering a contribution to society. What they did by their actions would be giving people who passed by the opportunity to be charitable. You know, Lazarus couldn't even do that. He was so debilitated. He sat at the poor man's gate in silence. Dogs would come and lick his wounds. They might have been trying to help. Maybe they were just adding insult to injury. Because Lazarus' name meant whom, he whom God helps, that was, we would expect then that the rich man would be an agent of God. If he's so blessed by God because of how good he was, he must surely come to the aid of this beggar at his gate to give Lazarus that opportunity to fill his job description. If Lazarus is begging right, then people will be giving to him. But the rich man saw Lazarus every day. He knew his name. He was aware of his need. And yet somehow he was able to put up those defenses. He had on his shield kept him from responding in any way. Day after day, same thing. Stepped over him, walked through, through the doorway. The distance between them, I think, grew each time that happened. The hardness of the rich man's heart just continued to grow. The parable doesn't condemn him for his riches. It's his attitude that brings him to ruin. He didn't care enough to do anything. His riches may well have contributed toward his careless attitude that he had, that he surrounded him so much with all these good things in life. He had contented himself with the idea that, yeah, God's blessing me. Look at all these good things that I have. I'm done. I'm taken care of. 
Now, the parable isn't suggesting that we should try to be like either the rich man or like Lazarus. Both are surprised, as the story goes, by what happens to them, and it isn't about being rich or poor. Jesus wasn't trying to make being rich a bad thing, nor was he trying to make being poor a desirable thing. We see here how the attitude of the rich man is a problem. Lazarus has died, and he's now being cradled in Abraham's bosom. It's from the realm of Hades that the rich man calls out and says, Abraham, send, you know, send him down here. Send Lazarus here to you know, send some, put some cool water on my tongue. Have him put his finger in, in the water and put it on the tip of my tongue. Even in death, the rich man is seeing Lazarus as an errand boy or maybe as a slave. I need something. Come and have someone bring it to me. That attitude went with him through the grave. And only at the end does he begin to think of someone else. That's when he begins to beg that Lazarus, okay, don't bring the water to me, but go to my brothers, go to my family, and warn them. Abraham asks, what's it take, rich man, to, to get through to someone? What would it take to break through with a message of change? Those questions perhaps are hard for us to consider, but I believe the scripture invites us to. What is it that would help us to recognize the chasms that exist between us and others? What is it that we may have done to push another away or that is a wall of divide that we wonder how it is we might get over? What is it? What would it take? for us to stop stepping over those around us who are in need, to see those who are with us, who are in our communities, and to begin bridging those gaps that are between us. Because that's a call, that's a wake-up call, perhaps, for each of us, for all of us. That God's kingdom's not fully here yet, that's for sure. That we've been given gifts and energies, ideas that we can not only use for our own benefit, but to make a difference here in our community, in our neighborhoods, and within our homes and families. We have things. We have plenty to share, and there are those in need. May we open our hands and freely give. May it be so for you and for me this day and always. Amen.